Howard, I've seen present about social media, uh, online technology, millennials, which he works with uh, very, very often every day. Uh, and he's going to give us a sense for the rapid change occurring in the technology sphere. So I need a clicker, which would be a help. And so I'm going to stand away from here so my time doesn't start until I get a clicker. <laughs> <coughs> and I'm going to just say that, the, that uh, one of the, uh, for Anna, one of the pithy phrases that I would share with you on why big corporations don't see it coming. <clears throat> and I'll, this is from Clay Christensen, who's a, a very good friend of mine. And he says that in that context, good enough isn't good enough. In a big corporation, good enough isn't good enough. And so up from the bottom come people that are willing to accept a partial solution and successively approximate till they get better rather than waiting for something to be perfect or really clear. And although I wasn't going to talk about the school, but Rob sort of signed me up for the school. Uh, as to Betsy, so when I started the school, we did a lot of ads, and one of the first ads was for parents, because our school is a two-year high-end vocational school for digital uh, maniacs, okay, in, in all the you know, uh, areas you would expect, and it's intended to train people to you know, fill these new needs for collaboration and teamwork and digital materials, because every corporation in the world is migrating from analog to digital. But in addressing parents, I had this issue that vocational school, God forbid, you know, the United States is the only place left where we think every kid has to have a four-year, you know, liberal arts degree in order to be uh, a human being. So we wrote all these ads, and one of, the ad, one of the ads to parents that I wrote, and this goes to what you said about flipping things upside down, was uh, I had the line, but I didn't have a headline, and so I decided to do it in a quote form. So I created a quote, and I figured, all right, I don't want it to be attributed to somebody real, so I attributed it to Roy Rogers, because I figured he's not going to complain, and Trigger will never tell anybody. And so the quote about these kids with these passions was very simple. It was attributed to Roy Rogers, and it was, it's so much easier to ride the horse in the direction he's headed. And that was the whole thing. I mean, we have 600 kids now. They're excited. They're passionate. Their parents think we're feeding them some kind of strange chemicals. <laughs> because they've gone from being slackers to these little martinets who say things like, you don't have to settle and there's a way to do things right and stuff like that. So anyway, that's the school. Okay, so social media. Aha. I want to start by giving you um, <clears throat> a, a little idea that will make you the smartest person, I hope, at uh, the cocktail parties you attend for the next, at least the next week or two. That's the nature of social media, sadly. Um, <laughs> And so it's the difference between the web as it used to be and the web as, as it is today. And here's the big difference. People, um, people don't necessarily know what social has really done, what social has really meant. But what, it, what has happened is the web up to social, and I would say Facebook is social, up to that time it was about anonymous and links. That was the nature of the web. It was an information gathering web. When we add people to that equation, it becomes the social web. And Facebook is pivotal because Facebook was the first place where they insisted that you really be you. And the significance of that is really important because as we add more and more to the web, more and more power, and this says if you can't read it, you look just like your profile picture. But the truth is, going forward, we're actually going to have to be who we are. And the reason for that is very simple, as it becomes a tool for medical, as it becomes a tool for financial, as it becomes a tool for, in every respect, uh, important relationships, uh, we're going to have to be real. And it was funny yesterday that Norm said that globalization is, you know, pivotal. What I would tell you is globalization is the forest, personalization are the trees. And globalization, you can drown in this amount of data if you don't know how to parse that into meaningful information and valuable information. So I'm going to talk about four things, four trends that are going to change every business, everything we do, all the ways that we work. And then I'll have one last little twist, which is about games, which is a central part of our school. And honestly, games are driving every form of education, every form of training, every form of learning going forward. We just don't call them games anymore. So hyper-personalization, we had no idea 
up till a few years ago, the degree to which we were going to have information on everyone in the world, the degree of precision that was going to be available to us, the ability to deliver specialized and targeted messages in astonishing ways, and how that's changing every aspect of business. These are the 57, and that's a Heinz ketchup thing over there because there were 57 ingredients in Heinz ketchup. 57 different things that Google grabs about you every search that you do on Google, every single search. 57 different metrics, okay, uh, that informs the Google process. And what I would tell you going forward is a really simple proposition. I think personal data is the oil of the, of the future. I think that what is going on is so pivotal to everything that we're looking at that it's, it's exciting and it's also very frightening. So to give you some idea of just how pervasive that engine is, 7 billion people in the world, 3 billion Google searches a day, okay? And here's what's frightening. Google isn't winning. Google isn't winning by far. Facebook is winning. And the reason that Facebook is winning is because in the online world today, the average American, just as an example, spends more time on Facebook than on just about everybody else combined. And if that wasn't bad enough, we live in this winner-take-all technology world where as a winner pulls away, people abandon all the sort of add-ons and all the other people, and Facebook is just crushing it. They're up to about 901 million users now. It's continuing to accelerate. You know, they've had some interesting hiccups with the IPO. It doesn't really matter at all. Why are they winning? Okay? They're winning because Google is a system that was built by a bunch of really smart engineers, and it's algorithmic, and it's backward looking. Okay? It's going to say, here's what you look for before. And as a grandfather who occasionally shops for Madame Alexander dolls, I really don't give a shit about them that much. Okay? So I've gotten 4,000 additional solicitations, tried to be nice to my granddaughters. You know, I learned my lesson. Whereas Facebook has the world's easiest job. Everybody in the world raising their hands. You know, kids under about 30 have no idea what privacy even means. Okay? Here's what I want, here's what I want to buy, here's what I'm interested in, here's who I'm connected to, here's how to influence me. So simply stated, Google a rearview mirror, okay? Facebook a sniper scope, okay? And that's why we're seeing this enormous shift in display advertising to Facebook that's in the billions already and accelerating. This is what Facebook knew about us in 2005. This is 2010. It's continuing to accelerate and Mark has a law, Zook has a law, right? Which is, as we figure out more and more reasons why everybody is sucked into this equation, why the value exchange, because we're lazy and because things that enhance our productivity and make us uh, avoid redundant things and everything else, everybody is going to eventually be co-opted into the system as a concern about, as I said, financial information or medical information. I mean. It doesn't take too long to say to somebody, would you rather the paramedic you know, working on you has this medical information about you at his fingertips, or would you wa rather wait for the ride to the hospital? Okay? And that's just one of the tiny you know, kinds of things that are going on to change this. So Facebook also continues to figure out amazing things like timeline that cause us to share even more information. You know, they, they were sharing real-time information, now they've invited us to share all this historical information, and we're suckers for this. When timeline first appears, it's your date of birth and not another thing, okay, in your whole timeline, and who doesn't want to sort of get involved in that? So timeline, verbs, another thing, okay? You know, we started with liking things. There won't be a dislike, but there'll be a want and a need, and individual businesses are now having the ability to create verbs, and that's just going to increase. And so Facebook Marketplace, just to give you an idea, what a powerful tool it is to have somebody who knows your identity, knows where you live, knows what your interests are, knows what you're looking for, and even has its own currency. Facebook credits. First year, $500 million worth of transactions. They figured out that they weren't giving Facebook credits away for free, and so they've monetized about 30 cents of every dollar being spent on every game on Zynga is now, every real dollar is, is now paid to Facebook. Uh, so, I don't want to go backwards, I'd like to go forward. Pinterest was mentioned just before, sort of sharing on steroids, okay? It's accelerated in an amazing, amazing fashion. 
Uh, the adoption is faster than anything to date. It blew right past Google+. But here's the interesting thing. The real world today is not about eyeballs. It's not about volume. It's about engagement and the time being spent on Pinterest on essentially free marketing and endorsement is enormous. And you know that's just one of these new uh, sort of so, uh, social sharing systems. I want, to, uh, I want to tell you how powerful Facebook Connect is. And again, if you haven't you know, understood this idea that either you can you know, iteratively type in a bunch of information for the four millionth time on a website, or you can press this little blue button and have all that information shared automatically. And so you get sucked into this social design. That was phase one. Phase two, the open graph, connected, by the way, to more than 9 million applications. And if you wonder why Facebook is constantly acquiring new little businesses, it's because of this very tool, which lets them track the activity that's going on across 9 million different new businesses. And they've enabled these businesses in amazing ways. Facebook Connect means you don't have to worry about your identity issues, authentication issues, information issues. All of that is just uh, uh, dealt with by about two lines of code. So to show you the power of this, this is the integration of Facebook and Amazon. Up here in the corner is my brother, who I barely talked to. But imagine you know, how, how it is that this now has told me what he's interested in and his birthday is coming up. So as much of a schmo as I am, I probably can't avoid knowing now and being chargeable with the fact that it, it's, it's his birthday. What's it done? It's improved the recommendations both for Amazon and for Facebook, and it's driven enormous growth in commerce. And so that's just one of these examples. Netflix is coming up shortly. I say I hope because there was this interesting question about sharing video information. You can share all the information you want about people's book purchases, but until Congress changed the law, you couldn't, this has a lot to do with congressmen and porn, I think, you couldn't share information about the rental of videos, okay? But now it's okay, it's okay. The law has been changed, and so we're looking forward. Now, let me show you how powerful this becomes when you integrate the new Ticketmaster service, okay? Ticketmaster, one click of the button, where are my friends sitting, okay? Which of my friends are attending? Okay? You can also make sure your family doesn't know where you're going. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> but imagine the ability to, to you know, fly across the whole world, you know, do these kinds of things, all based on the power of personalization. It's really important. That's number one. Number two, and this is, you know, this is the famous John Wanamaker you know, uh, knock on advertising. Half my advertising is wasted. I just don't know which half. Today, nothing should be wasted. Nothing in marketing should be other than totally measurable, totally scalable, totally accountable. And these are the demands that you should make on everybody who is driving the front ends and the consumer facing parts of your businesses. And so that's changed too. We didn't know that you could have businesses that in 30 days acquire 100 million anything. We didn't know that these were kind, these kinds of pools of these enormous numbers were even out there. And now it's trivial. It's trivial. We just had a company that slightly changed their application where they had 50,000 users and in about 32 days now has 6 million users and it's wow. just skyrocketing. And it's, it's very interesting because we can't even get our head around the size of these numbers. But if you look just at Twitter as sort of an engine of measuring the real world. So I think the world, by the way, will be divided into LinkedIn over here for business, over here will be Facebook for personal, and Twitter will be this engine for current information that I think is going to be really, really amazing. One, these aren't joke conversations. These are conversations with your vendors, your employees, your customers, everyone, and they are remarkably informative. Roger Ebert is a good guy. Who cares about Roger Ebert when a million people on Friday night will tell you what they thought about every single movie? Way more predictive. Google searches are now predicting real estate trends on a very, very arithmetic basis. Uh, this was an interesting thing that uh, when the iPhone, and I know the iPhone was recently you know, shunned, but when the iPhone was going to now be available through Verizon as well as AT&T, they did some amazing research using the Twitterverse to find out where people were sitting, okay? And so there were three different populations. Who's gonna stay with AT&T? who's on the fence, 
who can't stand AT&T. Now, if you're spending against marketing dollars now, what you can do is focus on the people on the fence, right? The people that are fat and happy, why waste a dollar talking to them? And the people who are coming anyway, why waste a dollar talking to them? So this kind of precision and targeting that's now available is amazing. We can tell the mood of the country, okay? Not only tell the mood of the country, but we can tell who's happy with us, who hates us, and who's undecided, okay? Sort of the, I think that was the Casey Stengel theory of, of baseball management, just keep the people who hate you away from the ones who are undecided. But within these channels, we can now tell who are the big talkers, okay? And one of the interesting things about things like clout and social influence measurement sites are saying, there are people driving the train, let's talk to them, let's co-op them authentically, but let's co-op them to be our partners. So we can tell which channel within each of these universes is also powerful for us. And so as you go down this path, now you know who they are, you know how to reach them, you know exactly what to spend against. And here's the amazing and the third consideration is we're all tethered, okay? And so we talk all the time now about something that we call smart reach, which is the content is less important than the context. If you hit me at the wrong time, I don't care about the information. If you hit me at the right time with the relevant information in the right place, it's a home run. And so the idea that connection is just beginning and that your toaster will very soon talk to you is some vision of where we're headed with respect to this. Constant contact, constant information, constant demand for more and more power, okay? And we're seeing this, of course, mobile phones have now exceeded PCs. We're seeing that smartphones in the rich target sort of zones in terms of the demographics are growing increasingly. Uh, and what we say is it's about space and place, but it's all mashed together now. And so we call this Moshal. And what is Moshal? Well, because everything has to have something, right? So Moshal is what do we need? When do we need it? Wherever we are and passive. So your phone becomes a decision-making assistant. It makes you smarter. It makes you you know, I don't think there was a single news story this Christmas that didn't have the person in the store looking at their phone while they were shopping. And of course, we think of Best Buy as just showrooms for Amazon now. So, uh, so the idea that these tools are more and more powerful, that they'll translate for us signs in foreign countries, that we'll shop for our groceries while we're waiting for the L, okay? That's what's going on here that will interact with screens in emotional, connective ways, that more and more gestures will now be ways that will naturally interface with all of these kinds of information systems, not by simply by typing anything, uh, but we'll order our Starbucks coffee on the window, okay, by simply, you know, sort of gesturing. We're doing new kinds of things. This is a project to keep the doors on stores that sell Nike shoes. Okay? So instead of having the doors open at noon and then have 4,000 people rush the store and break the doors down, this deploys the purchase opportunity in the middle of a field that's geo-fenced at 12 noon. So these were 400 rare pairs of airwalks. This is uh, in New York, and at noon exactly you could buy these uh, shoes, but only if you were in this geographic area. So it's sort of an interesting new twist. This also lets us project selling opportunities into the mall space. And when they say, well, you can't have signage in the mall, we say, well, show me the signage, okay? Because the signage is virtual. Uh, ambient awares at South by Southwest, a whole series of these things which tell you basically where your friends are, where your Facebook friends are in proximity to you using a combination of personal information and GPS intelligence. Glancy was one of the stars there. Uh, about 30 seconds uh, later, Facebook bought Glancy, uh, shut it down, and pretty much has it on its design path, but we're really not sure you know, what's going to happen. But they're continuing to do this uh, with great flexibility. Now, we're I talked about the phone, but actually the tablet is ultimately where we're headed. And it may be five inches, it may be 10 inches. It's the ultimate consumption device for content. And you can see this adoption curve, it's three times faster than the iPhone. And so we're seeing some amazing things. This is Google data, very interesting Google data. 
at six o'clock at night, we put our phones down, but we pick up these tablets. And one of the reasons is, I guess your kids can't tell you're doing work if you're using a tablet as opposed to being on your Blackberry. But in any event, the tablets are gonna be content consumption devices, they're gonna be our bed buddies, okay? And they're also very clearly going to be part of this equation where we're multitasking, where everything we're doing while we're watching TV, we're also doing other things. And so you're seeing into now and services like this that literally are gonna link what's going on on the television with collateral information that permits you to sort of see and enrich that television viewing experience, just another way that sort of that home environment is going to be enhanced and expanded. When you understand this connection idea, it turns out that the data is even more important than the connection itself. And so, for example, with McDonald's, we're talking about digital premiums. And the value of digital premiums is almost incalculable just in terms of what it avoids. It avoids inventory, it avoids cost, it, it avoids buying you know, $2 billion worth of plastic that nobody over six years old is interested in and everybody under six years old just wants to swallow, okay? So what we're doing is, <laughs> is creating the ability to go into a McDonald's store and up there is not the newest shake, up there is in fact a five digit code that downloads to your phone the hottest song of the week, okay? But not just downloads the hottest song of the week. McDonald's now knows who you are and can send you an infinite amount of additional information and coupon you and source you and track you in very interesting ways. And the consumer is totally comfortable with this. In stadiums, we're doing something, instead of hoping that the yellow Dorito wins the race, okay, what we're doing <laughs> is letting your phone drive the race, vote on the ref's call, okay, uh, vote on the encore. Now this is important because she needs to tour, yeah, likely she needs a third elbow, okay, she, but, but she needs to tour to sell those t-shirts and if mom drags you out to beat the traffic too early then she doesn't get to sell you the t-shirt, okay? But she can send you a video at home that says because you attended the concert tonight you can now buy the t-shirt online for, you know, 25% off. So, and by the way, all during the game, you can get a coupon to buy the guy sitting next to you a beer or whatever, whatever else you want. Why are we so concerned with mobile? Because email is dying. Kids don't answer their phones. They don't answer their phones because it might be mom or dad calling, okay? <laughs> so, it's falling radically. Teens are spending an enormous amount of text time. It's growing as they get older. Landline use is down. Okay, and not only is landline use down, cell phone use is down, okay? Texting is driving everything. Uh, so last, but equally, maybe most important of all, for 20 years now I've taught at Kellogg, maybe it's even more than that, and I've always said that when somebody brings me a business plan, if it doesn't save me time or money or increase my productivity, it's not a real business. And I didn't know that there was a fourth criteria. And the fourth criteria that is changing behavior of millions and millions of people every day is status, okay? We always knew status mattered, but we never knew that we could measure it. And now we can not only measure it, but we can publish it, okay? So status is so powerful that you're seeing new sites like Cloud. And honestly, if you were interviewing a marketing person today, and they didn't know not only what their clout score was, but it wasn't a reasonable clout score, you would be wasting your time talking to that person, okay? That's how engaged this is. And why is this important? Because these are the real new influencers, okay? These are the people that are driving a lot of stuff. And then lastly, one last thing about games, and then I'll be done, because I know I'm trying to be a good sport. Uh, here's what we've learned from games that's crucial. First of all, we've learned that Games are not for kids, okay? That games have an astonishing uh, number of people playing them, and they're grown-ups, okay? Which is very, very material. They're highly desirable, targeted grown-ups, okay? So when you compare a real farmer to a Farmville person, you know, 80 million Farmville people, by the way, 80 million Farmville people, um, and you discover that gamers are women, they're not the, even these little kids, okay? So that's important, but here's what the real learning was with respect to games. We're going into a world where no one will be able to figure out the price of anything for the consumer. The consumer, and this is what happens in games, 
you let me decide how much time I want to invest and how much money I want to invest, what the level of my commitment is, and how valuable that is to me, and it changes every minute. It changes every day. So we're seeing games, which is always the canary, okay, in the cave, always the canary. We're seeing games anticipate, essentially, the end of fixed pricing. That every product, every service will have to be available in every part of the spectrum because the consumer is gonna drive the train. And last but not least, this is really depressing news. So this is the change between 2009 and 2010, and twice as many companies abandoned social media, okay? Why? Because it's like dancing with an 800-pound gorilla, okay? You don't get to stop, and, and it's hard, it's hard. And so a lot of people gave up on it. That was insane, okay? You need to figure out how to do it right, but you can't give up on it. It's just too, too central to everything that's gonna be part of our future. So you shouldn't let it take over the life of you or your business or anything else. You should start small and scale. You should stick to it, what you can do and do well. You should track and measure everything. And honestly, if you can't find people that really love this stuff and think it's fun and do it authentically, then you're not gonna be successful. And that's all, thank you. Great.